as a means of making software freedom as frictionless as possible. That was the ice. Hello, everyone out there. Um, I hope you can hear me through this. I'm going to turn off desktop audio in the meantime. Uh, normally, this is where I would do a bunch of intros and stuff, but uh, but basically, I had a bunch of stuff to do this today. So 2 p.m. caught up to me. Corey Doctor, I was speaking at Hope Right Now, so I'm just going to straight over cut to him, and then we'll add commentary and talk about Hope and stuff at the end. So please enjoy the master of cyberpunk is now Corey Doctor. likes. Your printer uses DRM to force you to buy ink that the manufacturer has approved. Your phone uses DRM to force you to buy apps that the manufacturer has approved. Ventilators from Medtronic and tractors from John Deere use DRM to force you to get them repaired by the manufacturer and to scrap them when the manufacturer decides that it's time for you to buy a new one. Copyright laws, that is IP laws, ban tampering with DRM, making it a serious jailable felony to provide others with the tools to bypass DRM. From Section 1201 of the U.S. Millennium Copyright Act to Canada's Bill C-32 to Article 6 of the European Union's Copyright Directive, countries around the world have imposed indiscriminate bans on breaking DRM. And I should mention now, it's not in the talk, but Mexico has just adopted a law that does the same thing. And if you are in Mexico, you should uh, uh, look this up. There are petitions uh, we're hoping to get the Human Rights Commission in Mexico to revisit this law by the end of the month. That's, that's an aside. These are all copyright laws, but tellingly, the ban on breaking DRM is not limited to copyright infringement. 
bypassing DRM to get your printer to accept third-party ink is not a copyright violation. You're not reproducing the printer's code, nor are you duplicating the traces etched in its chips. But even though you're not breaking copyright when you jailbreak your phone, you're still breaking copyright law. The law bans legal conduct if you have DRM, uh, if you have to break DRM to engage in it. This isn't copyright protection, it's felony contempt of business model. And it's not just DRM. Uh, take Goldman Sands, a uh, free font released by the finance giant and global supervillain Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sands is a copyrighted work and it comes with a copyright license that you agree to when you download the font. Among the license terms for Goldman Sands is a non-disparagement clause. That is a clause that prohibits you from criticizing Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs does not need copyright law to prevent people from copying its font. It gives the font away for free. Goldman Sachs need co needs copyright law so that it can boss people around, so that it can tell them what they may and may not say. The risks to free expression and self-determination have always been latent in copyright, patent, and trademark, and these laws have historically been designed to minimize those risks. Every, each one of them has its own escape valve that theoretically stops IP owners from using their rights to take away your rights. Copyright has fair use or fair dealing in most non-US English speaking countries, which allows for many kinds of copying, adapting, displaying, and even selling of other people's copyrighted expressions, provided that these activities promote a free and robust discourse by transforming, commenting on, or analyzing a copyrighted work. Fair use does not depend on a copyright holder's permission. You can make fair uses even and especially when the rights holder doesn't want you to do so. Patent has its own self escape valve. It's got publication. To receive a patent, you have to disclose how your invention works, and those disclosures are on display from the start, where anyone can study them and use them as inspiration for their own inventions. Patents allow you to punish people who duplicate your invention, but they also require you to tell people exactly what steps they must take to affect such a duplication, and also provides a roadmap for replicating your invention's functions without violating your patent. Trademark has two important escape valves. First, trademark holders are limited to enforcing their marks against rivals who use them in deceptive ways, lies, live, um, likely to give a rise to public confusion. But second, trademark is subject to the nominative defense. It's not a violation of trademark to use the mark to describe goods or services that it's associated with. You can put a sign in your shop window that says, we fix iPhones or cheap, cheap ink for HP printers, or our cola tastes better than Coke, and there is nothing a trademark holder can do about it. These escape valves have been a lot less durable than I think we hoped. It turns out that much of their efficacy depends on there being robust competition in the marketplace, so that when one company tries to narrow, say, fair use in court, other companies that depend on fair use will spring up to defend it. Through the past four decades of massive consolidation in every industry, a consensus has emerged among the shareholder and managerial classes that these escape valves are defects in an otherwise excellent law, and they have set to work creating legal precedents, new laws, and new legal tactics to jam those valves shut. This is how we went from having software freedom cake to just having the icing. New copyright laws, like the ones that ban breaking DRM, new copyright precedents, like the one Oracle is seeking in its lawsuit against Google, and new tactics for combining copyright, patents, trademarks, DRM, trade secrets, and other IP, so that what trademark per permits, copyright prohibits, and what copyright permits, patent blocks, and so on and so on, until all the certainty has been moved off the onto the manufacturer's side of the deal, and all the risk has been moved onto your side of the deal. That's the third section, I guess. And this is the last section, I believe. Oh, penultimate section, sorry. Recall that the term that preceded IP was author's monopolies. The tale of how the latter was replaced with the former has many variations, but everyone agrees that it's just no fun to be called a monopolist. If you think you don't have enough copyright, it's hard to get Congress or Parliament uh, to go to Congress or Parliament and demand an expansion of your monopoly. It's far more pleasant to go demanding help in defending your property. There is a strict sense in which copyrights and patents are monopolies. When you write down a collection of words, like this essay that I wrote, uh, a new copyright is born. That copyright gives you the exclusive right to reproduce, adapt, display, or sell the essay. 
your rivals can compete with you by writing different essays that they hope will do will sell to the same magazine and tempt the same readers but you and you alone can sell the essay that you wrote in that sense it's obviously a monopoly a market for a product with only one seller in which which is the purest form of monopoly that there is but the word monopoly has a different definition in competition law. A monopolist isn't merely someone who controls 100% of a supply of a good or service. A monopolist is anyone who has market power, that is, the power to set prices. After HP sells you the printer, it can charge whatever it wants for ink. You could just junk your printer and buy another, but HP's rivals also charge absurd sums for ink, and they also use DRM and IP to punish companies uh, competitors who introduce cheap ink into the market. The people who bristled at having copyrights called monopolies, they have a point. It's a rare author who has market power. Authors, even the big name ones, have limited power to convince their publishers to pay over the odds. There are a few superstar exceptions, but they're rare as meteor strikes. Overwhelmingly, copyrights do not confer market power on the people who create them. However, there are actual market power monopolies in the entertainment industry. The single movie theater chain that controls the vast, uh, the vast majority of cinema screens, which is AMC, teetering on the verge of bankruptcy today. Um, there are the three record labels, four movie studios and five publishers. There's uh, shortly to be four if the rumors about Simon and Schuster being sold are true. Uh, the single national brick and mortar bookstore chain and the single global online bookseller, which also effectively owns the whole audiobook market. How did these monopolies emerge? Well, in some ways, they came from the same place that other monopolies in energy, eyewear, finance, automotive, aerospace, accounting, civil engineering, and logistics came from. Lacks antitrust enforcement. For 40 years, we've let companies grow by buying their small competitors before they could grow to become threats, to merge with their major competitors and cease competing with them, to corner vertical markets so they could squeeze labor, suppliers, and customers. But entertainment monopolies, they're special because they aggregate all of these authors' monopolies in vast quantities. These monopolies are durable in ways that mere market power is not. If you control one third of all the music that might be sampled by any new musician, you have a bottleneck that can't be evaded through cunning or creativity. Any attempt to break your monopoly is also a copyright infringement and doing at a commercial scale is a criminal copyright infringement. That is to stay, say, banking and, aerospace and monop uh, banking and aerospace monopolies, they can get sued for being anti-competitive, but entertainment monopolies can sue you for being pro-competitive. The result is a monopoly that controls access to distribution channels and audiences that can invoke the power of the state to fine or even imprison people who seek to challenge that monopoly. Even where tech is challenging those monopolies, it's doing so to create more monopolies. Kindle Unlimited presents a real challenge to traditional genre publishing, and every Kindle Unlimited book is released with DRM that locks it to Amazon's platform. Any attempt to liberate Kindle Unlimited books so they can be read with a rival's device or with a device designed to stop Amazon from spying on you while you read involves breaking the DRM and trafficking in tools to break DRM as a felony under Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998. Kindle Unlimited books aren't available in libraries, and giving librarians a tool to remove the DRM to add Kindle Unlimited books to their collections is a jailable offense. As Amazon conquers an ever larger proportion of genre readers, it permanently locks those readers into its platform, meaning any, author, any other author who wants to access those readers will have to do so on Amazon's terms, which include turning over the power of their author's monopoly to be used in Amazon's market power monopoly. Giving authors more copyright, a stronger monopoly, or if you give authors more copyright, a stronger monopoly, Amazon will seize that too as a condition of reaching the audience that Amazon has imprisoned in its walled garden. Authors' monopolies are not market power monopolies, but if you aggregate enough authors' monopolies in one place, you can turn, a, uh, into, you can turn them into a market power monopoly that's backed by the power of the courts and the prisons, and that accumulates more authors' monopolies every time someone enters your captive marketplace. All right, this is the big finish. You may have heard Mark Andreessen's famous praise, software is eating the world. That's not quite true. Software has eaten the world, past tense. If there was any, if there was any doubt the pandemic 
has erased it. Lockdown, viewing the world through our screens, there is no longer any distinction between human rights and digital rights. There is no software freedom. There is only freedom. Software is expanding relentlessly into every device and system, from ventilators to tractors, from toothbrushes to sex toys, from refrigerator filters to money itself. And wherever we find software, we find IP, that is software deployed to control the conduct of competitors, critics, and customers in such a way that overlapping systems of laws can be invoked to punish anyone who bypasses the software. The combinations of software and IP in every device is a sea change for the organization of our society. As firms have become increasingly concentrated, as monopolies have emerged in every sector, they have also figured out how to infuse their products with just enough software that they can invoke IP to control their competitors, critics, and customers. These are market power monopolies backstopped by creators' monopolies, which create IP rights that supercharge market power. All of this, it's just the curtain raiser. Software isn't just a way to put IP into otherwise inert objects. It's also a way to automate them, to make them into unblinking, ever vigilant enforcers for, for the manufacturer monopolist's interest. They can detect and interdict any attempt at unauthorized interoperability and call the appropriate authorities to punish the offender. This is a level of control beyond the wildest dreams of history's most sociopathic monopolists. Consider the coal boss who controlled his workers by moving them into company housing in a company town where they were paid in company script that they could only spend at a company store. This coal boss moves titanic amounts of risk off his balance sheet and onto his workers' balance sheet. Not only are they incapable of leaving for a better job without paying their debts, but they are also paid in non-interoperable proprietary money that only works at the company store where prices can be adjusted at will to ensure that the workers' debts can never be paid. But even that coal boss, a veritable god to his workers, was not all powerful. A coal worker could buy corn at the company store and trade it for real US greenbacks at the local moonshiner shed, converting non-interoperable script to interoperable dollars at a loss through the uh, intermediate exchange medium of corn. But think of a worker paid in company script today. The digitally enabled smart goods that they buy at their company score Store, rather, can be locked to their accounts the way Kindle books or iPhone apps are locked to your personal device. The unblinking eye of software enforcement systems is always watching, ready to discipline you for your lack of consideration for the shareholder's bottom line. Once we have cake, today we have icing. At this rate, the icing will be gone before long. There are no digital rights. There are only human rights. There is no software freedom. There's only human freedom. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we got some time for questions here, about um, 15 minutes, I think. Thank you for your patience. I know that wasn't as smooth a talk as I normally give. Uh, there are some questions for me here uh, that Greg has uh, thankfully uh, or thoughtfully uh, put into my little private chat where I can see them. So the first question is, is this like your bar room in the basement or, you know, just your house? Uh, no, this was our this was our play project. Um, for 20 years, I have been collecting junk that I would put in a bar someday when I had a bar. I actually lived in a warehouse in Toronto for a while that had a little bar, but that was decades ago. Uh, and so having moved this stuff back and forth across the Atlantic multiple occasions, we finally have a permanent home for it. We built this super ambitious bar in our backyard here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's got all the things. It's got black velvet art. It's got stuff from the Tiki Room and it has many boozes, many delicious boozes. And even a chandelier, let me see if I can get that in there. A chandelier made from whippet canisters. It's got all the things. Um, so another audience question here. Is Severe Haircut Woman making a comeback for the Third Little Brother book? Yeah, she totally is. Um, Oh, you're getting a lot of applause. They like the bar. Thank you. You know what? Hang on a second. I'm going to make a drink. I know this is this is riveting television, but uh, where'd it go? Oh, yeah. Kick and Chicken, the best $20 bourbon you can buy. Uh, also, also known as Fighting Cock. I swear by it and sometimes add it. Anyway, sun's over the yard arm somewhere. Um, the Third Little Brother book, Attack Surface, is the story of Masha. She's a young woman who appears at the beginning and the end of the first two Little Brother books, who starts off working at the DHS as a snoop, and then moves to a private contractor in the second book, loosely based on, on, um, 
on uh, 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 what are they called? Um, God, Eric Prince's outfit, uh, Black Blackwater. God, I kept wanting to say Blackstone, but that's the hedge fund. Yeah, Blackwater. By the third book, she's working for a version of something like the NSO group or Palantir. And uh, she is working in the former Soviet Union, putting down color revolutions, democratic revolutions. But she has a hard time living with herself. She's been at this long enough that she has some questions about her ethics. And so her hobby is teaching the resistance movement how to avoid the... Uh, the stuff that she's that she's building. So she spends all day putting spyware in the National Telco's data center and all night teaching the people it's spying on how to avoid it. This is not good career advice. It ends up tanking her career. Uh, she had been working for this surveillance contractor uh, where her boss was a former East German Stasi colonel. She calls Ilza she wolf of the SS. And uh, she gets fired. She ends up back in Oakland, California, where her old best friend is uh, working with a new movement called the Black Brown Alliance, which is like a successor to Black Lives Matter, a, a transracial uh, Latinx, uh, black and other racialized people, uh, class conscious uh, resistance movement. And they're being targeted by the same malware she built when she was working for Severe Haircut Lady, when she was working for uh, Carrie Johnstone. And Carrie Johnstone wants to hire her again because although they parted on not very good terms, Carrie Johnstone wants the contract to install surveillance gear in San Francisco and then use that as a reference customer to get the rest of the country. And so uh, it becomes both a story about resistance and justice, and also a story about the grubby business side, the, the millions of dollars at stake in selling this terrible software to city managers who would rather spy on people to neutralize them than do something about the grievances that uh, mobilizes them into the streets. All right. Uh, audience question. I love Walk Away. Do you think there, there, that it is more real than Little Brother? Are we getting closer to the, both of those worlds? So they're both intended as, you know, allegories, right? I mean, Little Brother, I wrote inspired by uh, Mark Klein, who was the AT&T whistleblower who walked into the old EFF offices on Shotwell Street in San Francisco with a folder full of papers and said, you know, I just retired from AT&T. While I was there, my boss made me build a secret room in our Folsom Street data center and I put a beam splitter in our fiber trunk and I ran a copy of the internet into this secret room where the NSA uh, spied on it. And we started suing the US government over, over that. And, and it was obvious that that had already happened. It was obvious that it was only gonna get worse. And so I wrote a futuristic version of the Mark Klein story in which it got worse. And of course it did. So if it seems prescient, it's only because it was like, it was just following the trajectory. Um, you know, Homeland predates uh, Snowden by a bit, but it doesn't predate the the lesson of the Mark Klein revelations, which is that um, lawmakers will lie and cheat to preserve their right to spy on us. Uh, and that is clearly true too. And that spying is a critical piece of the arsenal if you wanna stabilize a society without addressing its people's grievances. I mean, the best way to stabilize a society is to make it fair and just so that everyone has a, a place in it and people have a stake in keeping the status quo. Um, if you can't do that, the second best way is to figure out who's likely to make trouble and put them in jail. And that's what I think the surveillance project is about. And we have really doubled down in the years since on arresting people who make trouble rather than addressing the problems that they have. Uh, see the Black Lives Matter uprising, see what's going on in Portland right now, and so on. Um, and so Walkaway is set more or less in the apotheosis of that ethic, right, where where we've decided that we will do nothing to address the grievances of most people, and we will just find ways to neutralize them instead, sideline them and neutralize them. And, and I think both of those books represent a way to think about what's happening and what we can do about them. Uh, but neither of them are meant to be fully realized worlds that I think we're headed to. They're, they're cognitive tools for, for understanding the world that we are in right now. All right. Um, in the US, there is a conservative group with ties to big business that pushes pre-written laws on municipalities. Could hackers write law code? How do we install it? So you're talking about ALEC, the um, American Legislative Exchange Committee. ALEC does in fact write these laws that they promulgate around the country at the state level. So they introduce laws in, in state houses. Um, voter suppression laws are really common, anti-abortion laws, uh, uh, the ag gag laws that um, make it a felony to document uh, abuses in the agricultural sector, uh, both of workers and of livestock. 
um, as well as environmental problems and so on. Right now, ALEC is busy promulgating legislation that um, would absolve employers of responsibility if they kill their workers uh, with coronavirus by denying them PPE or by creating unsafe work in environments. So they're pretty bad guys. Their secret is that um, they have a very big tent. So every company benefits from some kind of bad law. They don't necessarily all benefit from all of them, but you know, Google wants this law, Facebook wants that law, Dow Chemicals wants a third law and so on. And what they've done is they've welded all those companies together in a single body. So what you have is Google donating to Alec to promote laws that are friendly to Google with the understanding that Dow Chemical is donating to Alec to promote laws that are uh, uh, pleasant for Dow. Google may not like the laws that benefit Dow, but they're willing to fund Dow's laws if it means that Dow funds their laws. So they've built this, this kind of coalition from hell. And it's very effective because there's so much money on the side of, uh, of, of um, Alex uh, uh, law pushes. It's, it's, it's legal entrepreneurship uh, and so much power that they're able to really score giant legislative victories nationwide. And so the question is, could we do our own? Well, we sort of do, right? We're just not as effective. So the, there were 18 right to repair laws or 20, no, 20 right to repair laws introduced in 2018 at the state level. All of them were defeated by Apple. Apple led a coalition of manufacturers to kill right to repair laws. Those 18 laws were promulgated by the Repair Coalition. Uh, it's led by iFixit, which is the amazing company in San Luis Obispo that Kyle Weens runs where you get manuals and tools for, for doing independent repair. And um, the problem is that they didn't have a coalition, right? That like there isn't there 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 isn't uh, what what they want to do is enable lots and lots of small and medium enterprises, individuals and small small firms, to affect repairs. And in aggregate, that has more benefit than allowing Apple and other big manufacturers to control repairs. But each of them gets less money than Apple does. Each of them has a lower margin, right? We as consumers retain more money because they charge lower prices and we get a better deal. And so there is less excess capital in that process to spend on lobbying. So they can be outspent by the likes of Apple. Um, and so that is the problem, right? That it's not a level playing field when you are pushing for bad laws that allow people to make lots of money by being abusive, you can take some of the money that the laws generate and use it to push for worse laws. When you are pushing for good laws that allow consumers to retain more of their money, whether that's money that you don't have to spend on a repair or money that you don't have to spend on bottled water because Flint's water is full of lead, um, that money uh, is harder to aggregate into one place and turn into a legislative initiative. I think that you know the obvious answer is limits on campaign finance and lobbying. Uh, and the hard problem is how do we get there, right? How, how do we aggregate enough money to fight the power of concentrated money? And you know, the last time we did this was, was with FDR. It was, it was with uh, the New Deal when we split up companies um, and we, we attacked monopolies. And I think we're gonna need something like that to make it happen. Okay, we've got um, four minutes remaining, according to my, my chat here. Is there, um, is there one more quick question? Or, uh, I can, oh, here we go. So what's the alternative to, uh, so the question is, uh, no doubt Amazon is doing all they can to control writers and readers. They wish to eliminate any form of choice. Very bad stuff indeed. What's our alternative? Even if we buy b and uh, they, they will be the same. Y yeah, I mean, I actually think BNM is slightly better. Um, the guy who's running it, uh, uh, Daunt, whatever his first name is, the guy who ran Daunt Books in the UK, Peter Daunt, is quite a good guy. Uh, they, they just brought him in to run it, but even so, and, and far more interested in literature than Bezos is. But that said, they're not your friends, right? Big corporations are not your friends and never gonna be your friends. What um, we need to realize is that you can't solve the problems of monopoly capitalism by shopping. You have to solve the problems of monopoly capitalism by mobilizing political force, right? Uh, the, the, the whole point of monopolies is that you don't have uh, meaningful choice in your market decisions. You are not an ambulatory wallet, you're, you're a citizen, right? You, you live in a democracy. I mean, it's a tarnished and tainted and degraded democracy to be sure, but you can do something about it. You can vote, 
You can get involved in uh, line item initiatives. You can back right to repair. If you're in Massachusetts, you have a right to repair ballot initiative coming up this year. You're right, shopping at BNM or even shopping at independent bookstores, God love them, is not gonna solve the problem of Amazon's monopoly. The thing that will solve the problem of Amazon's monopoly is reinstating the Sherman Act so they can't grow by buying their competitors or by creating vertical monopolies. That's the only thing that's gonna save us from that. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you to the 2600 folks and the Hope folks. I wish I was there with you on Long Island doing this in person as we had planned. Uh, it was gonna be one of the highlights of my summer, um, but uh, it was great to do this. And, and I hope you will all stick around and see all of the amazing programming that they have for you here at Hope. Um, I'll see you later. Greg, that's your cue. Thanks, Corey. We're gonna um, we'll we'll cut the end of this uh, session momentarily, and uh, really appreciate having you here. Excellent. Thank you. This talk is available on the uh, replay as well on the live stream, so people can enjoy it. There's. So let's figure something out here. Let's that. that. So, let's, uh, go back. See if my voice comes through. Can you guys hear me? There was a little bit of a delay. Okay, so. All right, so apparently I'm very low in voice right now, or mid-size in voice, but at least you guys can hear me. Uh, in the future stream, I'll try to make this louder. Okay. So yeah, that was uh, what Corey Doctorow was talking about. I'm going to temporarily grow myself right now. Here we go. Ooh, ah. Hi, guys. So that was Corey Doctorow uh, talking. Uh, originally, we were supposed to do like introductions like 10 minutes before I started streaming, but... Uh, actually, I just realized I'm missing something here, so just give me one moment, I will be right back. I am so scrambling everywhere today, you guys have no, here it is, you guys have no idea out there. But let's put this guy on, as much as he doesn't smell the, smell the best right now, and as much as how it's going to make me sweat. Uh, there we go. There we go. Now it feels more like hackers on planet Earth. Um, so normally I'm supposed to do, like, I'm supposed to do intros, and I was going to talk a little bit about Cory Doctorow and stuff, but then I got out of the shower, realized it was already two p uh, 4 p.m., and went, ah! and started doing crazy stuff. So I'm going to do the intros. We're going to talk and chat a bit, and then we're going to kind of look at, like, what's going on with Hope today and what we're doing uh, during it, basically. Uh, so I'm Side Pocket. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of uh, DEF CON Tool 1. Uh, we are a, the main DEF CON, right now the only DEF CON group in New Jersey. <laughs> We've been going on for over three years, but you can find us out at www.defcontool1.org. You can also find us on all the social medias down here, such as our Twitter and uh Instagram, uh, TikTok, we're still going back and forth on because we have one, but we haven't been using it, GitHub, and uh, we have our own Onion uh, portal, and you can also watch the stream uh, um, through uh, Invidious, which is a mirror of uh, YouTube on uh, tour, so that's also fun. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let me take some water here. But uh, we, we normally meet Third Five every month in Jersey City. And because of COVID and that cops hate everyone and how crazy my hair is, um, not only have we been live streaming all of our uh, all of our uh, streams, but we've also been um, making new shows. Uh, we we do like these little mini shows, and you are gonna have to get really get used to the DefCon 201 special splash screen because this is probably gonna be the most 
amount we're ever going to live stream <laughs> because ha ultimate ha hacker summer camp not only became ultimate hacker summer camp where hope is now in the same range as all the other conventions that normally happen around defcon time but because of covid and everyone's remote basically hacker summer camp is now the entire month of august we're not even in august this is the week before august and there's there's two conventions going on right now uh with the main one being hackers on planet earth so uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff for it, but before I get into what we're doing, we're going to check some of that stuff that I want to read in chat here. Uh, one uh, Ski asked, uh, what projects are you guys presenting for DEF CON? Yes. Um, later on today, I'm going to finish all the messages and uh, emails for that. Uh, there is an announcement. I can tell you a little bit about it right now, and then we're going to flesh out more details probably on Monday. You'll hear the big announcement for it, I believe. Um, there will be, for the first time ever, because we can do this virtually and all the meetings with people are online. Uh, I just want to make sure there's something here. Okay. Is that... Uh, come on, mute. There we go. Uh, there will be a uh, DEF CON um, groups village. You would think that would be like one of the core things in DEF CON since like the beginning or when DEF CON groups started, but um, due to the opportunity of COVID, and the whole virtualization, we're having a virtual village basically set up at the last minute, but it's going to go really well. And when I mean virtual, we're actually going to do this in VR, and we're going to have groups come out throughout the day, and they're going to talk about who they are, show off some of the projects they work on, show off some of the cool talks and moments they've had during their years or even days of operation. And then in um, and there's also going to be like a party in VR during DEF CON next week in that same uh, VR room that we're going to use so that's going to be really awesome we're hoping that it goes really well and i just realized something i should be live streaming on instagram right now because i have i have my phone right here and this is how jumbled i am when we do the next keynote uh this will all be already pre-set up and i won't have to like do crazy stuff beforehand so i'll be able to do anything but let's 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 get on um let's get on instagram right now go to live uh, let's flip this around, and uh, let's hit record. So yeah, um, also to everyone on Instagram out there, uh, just as a reiteration, welcome. This is Side Pocket. Uh, we're right now going through uh, Hope 2020 stuff, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, that's why we're streaming. We're actually streaming right now on our normal live stream channels, but I thought we'd pull up uh, Instagram uh, just for all the Instagram people uh, to join in. So hello out there. Uh, so I'm going to go through quickly the spiel again. Uh, someone just asked in our chat, uh, what projects are we guys presenting for DEF CON? Uh, I can officially say, although we should have a lot more details on Monday because I'm involved with this, is that we are going to do a, um, let me adjust this camera a bit more. There we go. Uh, we are going to be having, for the first time ever, a, it's so weird with the double cameras, I feel like I'm in a porno, uh, a DEF CON groups village virtually. Um, and when I mean virtual, it's actually going to be completely done in VR. It's going to be really cool. We're going to have groups from all over the, across the United States and around the world talk about their groups, share their moments, show off cool projects and, and speaking and stuff that they've been working on. And then at some point, we're going to have a giant VR party. So that's going to be really fun. And we're hoping, we're hoping that with this that being successful this virtually, virtually, that, that we'll, be we'll be able to bring this bring into... into um, an actual, an actual physical, physical DEF CON groups DEF village, village next year next for DEF CON. So that's all I can that's say for now. Can um, I have to finish up emails later today on that because uh, I've been very busy. Uh, if I, I will be shocked if I will live in September and then like I will drink all the alcohol come September 1st because there's so much going on. I mean, if you look, we're going to have seven to eight guides just for August alone for all the hacker conventions going on. So that, that's how crazy my stuff's going to be. And, of course, I'm still doing bits of stuff for Hope. Um, and I'm going to be really involved in the DEF CON group section and DEF CON. So it's going to be crazy, crazy stuff. Um, but what we just went through right there was Corey Doctorow just did the keynote. Um, the main thing our group's going to be doing for Hope, and like I said on the stream, get used to, and by the way, we stream on uh, Twitch TV, DLive, YouTube. You can also see our YouTube 
through uh, Tor via, via Avidius. And yay, Dirty Jersey. Thank you, Satan, my ninjas. It's one of the people on uh, Twitch right there. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, whether it's in Instagram or on any of the live streams on here, please uh, let us know. And it's going down. I'm just going over what Cory Doctorow just went out and said. Um, Cory Doctorow, I, I have to double check, but this is this is a Hope Pen shirt. Let's see. Hope X. And it also has the giant graphic on the back side of it that's probably all wrinkled right now. I don't know if you can see. Because that's just how they like to do with the shirts. Is like a, I don't even know if you can see it properly. Is they like to, uh, they like to, um, oh god, this is like an exercise. They like to do like minimal graphic on the front and giant graphic in the back. And I believe that was the year Cory Doctorow um, spoke. It's one of the years. I'll double check. But that was a fun. There's an echo. Okay, I know how to eliminate the echo. There we go. That should do it. It was a really fun convention because, like. We already went through, because uh, I've been, by the way, real background, uh, one of my first hacker conventions was Hope, my first Hackers on Planet Earth, which is a hacker convention that normally happens in New York City, and uh, being next to uh, New York City and Jersey City and stuff like that, and being in New Jersey, that's a whole thing. Someone just wrote on Instagram, I'm presenting to Mark Lesse at Hope Day at 8 p.m. I, I'm going to try to check your thing out. In fact, I'll make a note about that, so I'm going to stick a pin in that and go back to that. But thank you, uh, Douglas. Uh, I will I will look forward to that because this is kind of the thing what we're going to be doing here. But, yeah, my first hope was, ironically enough, the last hope because I didn't have enough time to go to hope number six. I have known about hope for years because of the 2600 issues, but I was literally in school at the time, at, like, middle school, <laughs> yeah, elementary middle school. <laughs> So I couldn't go anywhere, and then when I finally graduated high school, I went to the New York City 2600 meetings, and then I, I did Hope, and I usually volunteer, which I'm trying to do this time at Radio Statler and stuff like that. People usually know me at the Radio Statler booth. Hello, Lalit on uh, Instagram. And uh, voila, um, we made DEF CON 201 here locally, and this is where everything's going. But uh, So that's a bit of my background right there. So I've been very involved with the Hackers on Planet Earth convention. Um, what I like about it normally is that, and even still now, it's one extremely community oriented. Like, yes, there are security workshops and talks and stuff, but it really focuses on about like, and I hate using this because it's like a dirty word now, even though it shouldn't be. They focus a lot on like the politics and social aspects of hacking, as well as just internally in the community. Like one of the biggest panels that they've ever done was they had an entire panel about mental health in the community, just like how we had an entire um, speaking panel about mental health in uh, in uh, May for uh, DEF CON 201 for our meeting. Because, you know, if you're just focusing on binary and, you know, hex, hex editors and stuff all the time, you know, you burn yourself out, you're essentially a startup and you turn into Google and we don't want that. So that's, that's it's very important to focus on the community stuff. And of course, uh, Hope is known for its hacktivism. They base themselves off of the Chaos Computer Congress and uh, just mostly like the, a lot of the East Coast scene, it's more related to the Western European hacker scene. I would say the West Coast more resembles what the hacker scene used to look overall in America, but even that's changed a lot internally. So that basically the old scene from the 80s and 90s, just completely forget about that. In fact, there's a lot of bad things with that that we should forget about that dead serious um, because, you know, we want to we wanna put a foot in front of each other and not go backwards. So um, what we're going to be mainly doing for Hope 2020 is install virtual web. And they decided that instead of the normal three-day conference, they're going to take out an entire week. And literally right when it ends, that's when Black Hat USA starts. And ah, but what was I going to say here? This is so annoying. Yes. Is that, uh, get rid of this. That should do the entire echo. Uh, and let, let us know, by the way, if, if you can hear us out there in uh, Twitch um, and YouTube and, and uh, what was DLive and stuff, because Mixer's dead. We're going to set up a, a Facebook really soon, but that's about that. But anyhow, I'm rambling too much. What we're going to uh, do, starting today, as we try to do a Cory Doctor Hour, and we're going to be on time the rest of the week, is every 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there will be a keynote. And... What we might look at a panel before the keynote or after the keynote, depending on what it is. I know my friend XLogic, who's a really awesome dude that originally came from Phoenix, Arizona, and moved to New York a couple years ago. Fun fact, 
uh, when I was homeless for a period, literally, and I was like couch crashing, he just gave me his deluxe inflatable mattress to use. So I would have an actual mattress. He's like a really awesome, cool guy. And he's doing like, if I remember correctly, like how to do coding of the metal and bootloaders for video games to explore like how you can basically hack and, and F around with, with boot and bootloaders. It's really neat. We might look at that a little bit, but I kind of want to go through hope stuff. But anyhow, every 4 p.m. this entire week until August 2nd, I believe, either August 1st or August, August 2nd, um, there will be a keynote. And whether we start an hour beforehand or continue an hour after or if it's even 15 or 10 or 5 minutes before the keynote, we will – so in addition to rehosting on Twitch the live streams and keynote, we are also going to um, – do this where we have the keynote in the background and during the keynote i'll be actually doing some bits of commentary and we're going to comment at the end i'm basically going to introduce the speaker and talk about my pre-opinions about them and about what i know about them if any and then i'm going to uh let them talk i might do some quibs here and there and then we're going to talk in chat of what we just saw and cory doctor i was kind of interesting because again uh for Hope reasons, he was a keynote one year. I believe he was a key, the keynote for Hope 10. It might have been Hope 11. There's so many of them. This is the 13th one we're on now because let's forget about the 12th one. My nose is so shiny. I have a shiny nose. But uh, it was cool because while he's like, you know, a lot of people love him and he's like, a, people are a huge fan of him and stuff. He, uh, you know, he's not an Edward Snowden. He's not a Julian Assange. God forbid. Um, he's not a Yes Men. He's not any of these like, you know, he's not the former head of the NSA. So what was really neat was he was enough of a big speaker to be a keynote, but he wasn't like super god tier. In that way, a lot of people felt really comfortable submitting in their works. And that was just so cool to see. So like basically that was like the best year for talks because it was just so much awesome stuff going on with talks that year. <laughs> uh, so I thank Cory Dr. Vell. Also, I've met him before. Uh, the first time I actually met him was at New York Comic Con. Unfortunately, I either – it's buried in my room or I don't have any more, but my favorite book of his is Makers. Uh, it's actually one of the first books of his that I, I've read, and I actually brought that with me. And not only did he sign it, but because he was like, oh, I've seen you at Hope, he drew one of my favorite in-jokes where he wrote and drew a little sketch of him wearing the goggles and the hot air balloon that he's in an XKCD. And I thought that was great because I love stuff like that. The one book that we do have with me because it's on off of uh, our co-founder G.I. Jack's uh, shelf is uh, this book uh, called Radicalized, uh, which is, if I remember correctly, is about how people get uh, um, radicalized through digital means and like through the internet and social media and stuff. So that's the Cory Doctorow book I'm kind of repping here. Uh, and I do have one. If tomorrow, if I have it and I find it, I'll show that on the stream for the next keynote. I wish I could have it. Again, we were blindsided by this. I'm just happy we made the freaking uh, guide for Hope. And I, I'm making, I think, another guide tonight. And then, like, every day during Hope, I'm making a guide until all the guides are, are done, basically. So it's a lot of guides. Uh, but, yeah, that, that was his talk. And, you know, he works with the EFF a lot, and he covers a lot of um, – like, he's very good at, which I think he has to because that's what he narratively writes about, like, you know, he writes to me what I feel like is true cyberpunk where he's talking about now and kind of the general direction of where we're heading. And then he just pumps that through steroids. I'm going to wait for this person. Pumps that through steroids and then puts that out there as fiction. And then what I love about Cory Doctorow books is that literally within a year or two, his books are in the nonfiction section because all of them came true. So that that's the thing that happens there with him and I'm glad that he also elaborated a lot on like copyright and why we have it and how literally insidious it is not just pure copyright but all the systems um, around it and like why companies support things in and it, he really well explained like how systems work and thus you have the systemic stuff hence the terms like systemic racism uh, we have systemic um, like corporatism and stuff like that in our society so I'm glad he got to clarify that more and it was also real awesome like, you know, we have a, like, up here, if you can see with this camera, and then I'll use my phone camera. You know, we have, like, some alcohol here, and then we have some alcohol up there in this dirty uh, thing place that I call a living room because it's my fault. And I'll show it with the phone here. We usually have, we have some alcohol up there. We usually make our own absinthe for Hope. We might drink the remainder of that later. It's still good, and we have little bottles up there. But um, we, uh, what do you call it? Um, 
it was so cool that he has like this giant it's like he was in his basement in like a winery or something there's just all this alcohol behind him it's like one of the most hope things i could think of like i'm pretty sure if he could legally had like tabs of acid and a giant pile of weed which depending on the state he's in right now he might be able to do on the street that he would do that too because that's kind of what hope is it's just everyone's high on drugs and getting bit by bed bugs and it's 4 p.m and people are going around on giant segways and to be honest, I kind of miss that. Like, that's the weird part about this is, like, I get to literally roll out of my own comfortable bed and walk into my comfortable living room and get food that I actually have with me. And even if I go out to get food, it's not, like, $8 billion like it is in Midtown or wherever the hell it would be on the new college campus they picked uh, that was going to happen this year. And, you know, and then there's just normal hope. Like, <laughs> like that's just so weird. It's like, where's the uncomfortableness? Where's me being groggy and energetic? Where's... Whereas me trying to talk with security because BFF people decided to go onto the roof and basically because they're famous, uh, all 8 billion con people tried to go on the roof and the cops nearly showed up and killed everyone, which is something that basically happened one year. Um, so yeah, there's all of that. But what we're going to do now, uh, now that I got that through, and this is something that I'm still going to do setups to this, so this will be kind of an experiment for all of us, is I'm going to re-shrink myself again and we're going to look at hope proper and this is actually where i'm going to end yep that's uh i've seen this this is um x logic snake game that he's made at assembly that's what this is yep it's the just the i think he may have put an ai on this and it goes through oh that's the i'll have to look that up later uh but this will be the end right now for the um instagram stream uh i will be doing these uh, Instagrams um, every time after the keynote speaker, but if you want to follow along with the keynote speaker and see what I'm doing during the live stream every day this week when we look at the keynotes for Hope and some of the act some of these side activities, um, just go to defcon21.org. Um, we're, we're going to have the live stream links there soon, um, but if you forget anything, just type in defcon21 live on Twitch. And you'll find us on Twitch, and we get the alerts for those. You can also find us DefCon Two One on YouTube, and we're also DefCon Two One on D Live. And soon we're gonna have like a Facebook or something, and hopefully we'll get our Periscope back soon. But I'm gonna say goodbye now to the uh, Instagram side of things, and we're gonna continue on with the mainstream. So check us there. Uh, also, if you go to our Instagram and click on our Hope posts, it will have all the live stream links below. So see you all there. It'll be one last wave. Uh, talk to you guys soon, and I can't wait to see what we do for our DefCon Two One meeting because. I know that it seems like all the DEF CON 2 web meetings are crazy, particularly when it comes to the speaker lineup, but I basically, for this upcoming meeting, I've put in all the people I couldn't fit in last meeting in this one, and it's not because these were bad. In fact, honestly, these were some of the best people. It's just they literally didn't have enough time just due to their own scheduling, which I know because I'm really busy now, especially with the whole DEF CON group stuff going on next week and for, for DEF CON safe mode. And... Um, and yeah, so like these these people are like this is gonna be some like truly like if you thought the last meeting was leap hacker stuff with IRC three and like infosec business and you know uh, doing digital graffiti uh, illegally uh, in that legal gray area, wait till you see the speakers that we have for August. We're gonna hopefully announce those by the time Hope ends, and this will be really fun. So. See you guys on Instagram. Uh, keep following us on our posts. Uh, share them if you want. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy our content. And I will see you soon. So peace out there on Instagram. So that was that. I'm going to do the share to IGTV thing and do the setup for it later uh, with my crazy glowing afro. But let's focus on this now. So uh, let's let's quickly see what XLogic's talking about here. And then, um, and then we're going to look at other stuff at Hope. So now let's take a look at what these cheats look like in action. We'll start with Tetranglix, and for all these examples, we'll see all the cheats, but the ones bolded in green are the ones we're actually going to see a demo of. Um, in this case, we'll look at the square patch. The time patch, you can kind of understand. Um, and then the other ones mostly are dealing with the, the scoring, like there is a hard-coded set of or 100,000 where the game kind of stops. We can set that to 1,000, um, and we can even make the score increment in uh, doses of 255 instead of just one point. So let's take a look at a, a playthrough with the square patch. All right, so for each of these demos, uh, I'm gonna go through the whole process of Git cloning the original source, going to the directory, assembling it with NASM, and then just playing the original real quick just to show the original state of it um, with QMU. Um, so we've assembled it, and now I'm just gonna run it with QMU real quick here. And this is 
Always the trend true. Was in its original form, you know, without the color or any of that stuff. So yeah, this is as Fuji Tetris as you can we'll get. Go to Fuji. All right. So what, what I'll then do for the rest of this and the rest of the videos is I'll go ahead and list out all the sheets for this particular game. So I got to go back to the directory and do Fuji and just kind of wild card for Tetranglix here. And those are the patches I can apply for Tetranglix. And like I said, for this one, I'm just going to do the all squares patch. So I'm doing the patch, um, and then Bugini and Tetranglix square. Let's go ahead and patch it. And then now I do got to reassemble it because I'm patching the source, not the game itself. So we reassembled it. Let's play it. And this sort of looks like square, square, <laughs> square. I'll do a couple lines. I'll, I'll fast forward it here in a second. Um, to show the ridiculousness of this, but yeah, all squares. Bag, the uh, the bag randomization is basically off. Yeah. This is like really, if you want to rectify scores, this is probably a quicker, better way to do it. Um, just keep those the only up way like that. This instead more of crazy all down all that. Yeah. Lines. For invaders, we can overall slow it down, but instead it'd be more interesting to give us so many lives we're practically invincible, and then we'll make the guys advance down a third of the, the distance each time, giving us ample time to take them out. Let's take a look at that. Right, let's go ahead and clone invaders here and go to it, build it, run it. And this is normal invaders, normal gameplay here. It's actually pretty challenging in my opinion. All right, now let's start doing boot genie to it. Gonna do the extra lives patch and then the slower advancement patch here. Go ahead and play it now. And just watch real quick how they advance down right here barely any and you know with 127 lives i don't have to worry about getting shot so here's the, the game sped up a little bit and i'm still not playing perfectly here but um as you can see it's still a little easier we can make it really easy to get a high score with food genie we made the whole uh, thing all the enemies we can make the difference between area. pipes really large so we don't hit them as much we can add a whole bunch of pipes to get the score quicker and we can actually make the game faster it won't make it more challenging in this case because the pipe clearance is so large and we just rack up the score even quicker that way so let's take a look at that right, let's go ahead and clone f bird go to it assemble it and play it in its original state and this is what it looks like here. It's not too bad. It's kind of challenging, but still possible. All right, let's do our first patch. We're going to kind of do these one at a time here, just to show the differences as they build upon each other. So we're going to do the, the pipe patch. Let's go and play this. So what this does is gives that extra clearance. So now it's just super easy. Um, but I mean, it's it's kind of more boring now just because it's kind of slow and all that. We want to rack up the high score quickly. So we're gonna add another patch here, more pipes. So when we do this, you'll see they're not so far spaced apart. See how there's a lot more pipes there so we can kind of rack up the score a little bit quicker. So that's cool. But one more. Now the game plays really, really fast. And this actually reveals something that most people probably wouldn't see if they play the game naturally. Um, once we get past a certain point here, we're going to go into like no man's land or whatever. Where oh, it kind of goes back to without, what it looks like, like without uh, the sheets on some parts. It's like 256 mode from, uh, from, uh, Pac -Man. Pac -Man. where it basically runs out of memory and data, so it just right, it gives close up. Now. There we are. So there's a lot of ways we can cheat at Tron Solitaire. First, we can make the initial score really close to the score to win the game. We can make the game slower. Uh, for the other speed hack, we can make the game not progressively get faster. Uh, we can do no clipping, which is basically invincibility. Um, we can set the score required to win the game much lower, so we just get to it quicker that way. Um, and then lastly, we can set every item to not be poisoned, so they're all power-ups, good power-ups. Uh, for this, though, for the demo, we're just going to look at the speed patch. We're going to make it really slow. All right, now with Tron Solitaire, we're going to grab it, assemble it, play it. This is kind of what it looks like in real time. I'm just going to play it until I see uh, a green apple, as, as they're called, instead of these red poison apples. A lot of poison. There we go. So there's a green apple down there. All right, we're good. 
Now let's do a speed patch to it, make it a lot slower. So this is how unplayably slow it is, it's kind of boring. So obviously I'm going to speed up the video. But this game is slow enough to where I, I can beat it more consistently. Like I have beaten this game without any of the, the cheats, but when it's this slow, it's easy enough to consistently beat it. So let me speed it up in a second here. There we go. And you can see the score down there. Um, it's in hex, whatever. And every uh, like 4,000 hex, the game naturally speeds up on its own. Unless you add the other speed patch to where it, it won't do that then. But we're not going to use that. We don't really need it. So we're almost up to 6K. There we go. Getting close to halfway there with the 8K. And the game will get ridiculously fast at that point. Yeah, past 8K. We're about to win. This is like the this coolest, like way, the to coolest way to cheat. Almost there. Just trying to avoid all the poison apples, but it gets hard after a while. There we go. We won. That's the flashy wind screen, screen that we get here. For Bootman, we can play in a completely different level. We could even be invincible, but for the purpose of the demo, we're going to make it really slow, and then we'll do the strong pill patch, which makes the ghost run away for a lot longer. In fact, it, you can go from pill to pill and not have the ghost attacking you at all that lasts so long. So let's take a look at that. Right, so let's look at Bootman right here from Guy Hill. I'm going to go ahead and get clone this. And we'll go into the directory, and then we're going to build it. Or assemble it. I just got the and weirdest play it real quick to see what it looks like in its original form. So here we go, just playing through a little bit. Not really doing much, I'm dying. All right, now let's just take a look at the collection of cheats. Look at our catalog. That's what we got to pick from. So first one we're gonna do here. Bootman. Do the speed one make it a lot slower, although the video will speed it up when we get to that. And then the strong pill one, so it lasts longer. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and rebuild it, reassemble it, and see what this game plays like now. Anyhow, um, that's going to be our... Uh, I just wanted to look that real quick. This is like a hilarious Pac-Man. Cloudy's doing boot man. Oh, it's Pac-Man. I thought he was doing like uh, like Donkey Kong or something. But that, I just wanted to show a bit of that. Um, they are streaming this on Twitch, by the way, and YouTube. It's Twitch, YouTube, and Periscope, as well as their own independent streams. Um, we are going to, every day, we host the Internet Society stream for Hope on Twitch. So if you don't know how to find and watch um, def, uh, the uh, Hope Conference talks, uh, if you go to our Twitch I'm going to try to do this on YouTube, but if you go particularly to our Twitch, um, you will see the conference. You'll have to click, like, probably behind the previous video, and it says, you know, hey, while they're not broadcasting it, and it will show hope. And then, of course, when we're live on the keynotes, we're going to be rebroadcasting what, what, we're, what we're doing. But uh, what I want to do instead now is I actually want to look at some hope stuff. So this is the current website right now. Um, and it is kind of, they do have a lot of stuff here, but it's kind of confusing. In fact, I actually want to go back in time here. Let's look at Hope 10's website. Yeah, it's this. And this actually, no, this was Edward Snowden. Okay, so Cory Doctor didn't talk at this one. He actually probably talked to Hope 11, and I, I don't, I don't think I have a, I don't, a skirt. I almost said a skirt. I don't think I have a shirt for that. Um, let, let me see here, uh, because it should be somewhere in the middle, uh, the, on Saturday is the keynote. Yep. So yeah, Hope Eleven after Snowden is he he talk. I don't, I don't believe I have a Hope Eleven shirt. I'll try to look for it because each day I'm gonna wear a different Hope thing that I have. So I'm probably not gonna, I'm probably gonna start reusing things after like seven or eight, like after uh, four or five days. But you know, uh, just wanna show how long I've been doing Hope stuff and volunteering and stuff like that. I'll probably extend it by wearing Radio Statler stuff, which is something I'm gonna check out soon. So yeah, this is kind of the Hope website this year. Uh, I'm shocked they didn't do like a tagline like hindsight is 2020 or something like that. Maybe they thought it was too lame. I don't know. But and I, I have no idea what all these stars mean either, to be honest. Uh, maybe that's the amount of years. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep, it is. It's the amount of years. Thirteen years. This is the thirteenth hope, technically. Uh, they thought it was going to be their lucky number, but it wasn't. Originally, they were going to meet out on a college campus in Queens, and we're all preparing for that. And it was already bad enough that literally the Hope and DEF CON for once was a week apart. But now that they've done this whole seven-day thing, like where they put up r like right when this ends the next day, Black Hat begins publicly for most people, which then leads directly into DEF CON. And it's like, bleh, so, And that's just the first two weeks here. And then it's just going to get more crazy and for anyone who's kind of confused, if you go to our website and you click on news, we've started making guides for the cons. And uh, it was supposed to be last night, but early this morning, we made one giant one for Hope 2020. Because uh, the website is mostly good, but it is really spread out. Like, you know, if you go to the workshop page, like they do have, I will say this, um, they do actually have a proper grid for the schedule. Um, it's not a perfect grid, but they, you know, before. It always default to their giant just post list, like it's a Craigslist post or something like that, or some like uh, what what's uh, that thing like a using that post basically they made. Uh, but now they actually have a actual grid like this where you have the public talk stream. We are currently at Boot Genie here, um, and uh, and they also broke it down. I actually like this breakdown where it's workshops, performances, and more, which is usually mostly blank until like after most of the talks. Uh, we might stream some demo scene stuff. We'll see how that goes. Maybe part of the hackers got talent, and uh, and I'll, I'll answer that question in a moment. And then they have like all the side day stuff that we're gonna look into. But I know that like with when we do normal summer camp, it's usually really confusing. So we're gonna post these guides now. Last time we posted uh, five guides. Two of the guides were extra because one focused on how to survive in Vegas and one's focused on all the after parties that weren't the three cons. And the cons we focused were, which is usually what Hacker Summer Camp is for the most part, is um, B-Sides Las Vegas, Bl uh, Black Hat USA, and DEF CON. This year, um, unfortunately, B-Sides Las Vegas canceled. Uh, they, they, even more than hope, they really feel themselves as like the in-person community thing. So they decided to just cancel it, and also that way everyone could be safe, and they did that way early on, long ago, and I commend them for that, and I still can't wait. If you've never gone to Bla uh, Besides Las Vegas, out of all of them, that's the biggest one that I recommend. Like, definitely try to attend DEF CON, but, like, especially if you've been going to DEF CON or something for a while and you feel calm burnout, go to Besides Las Vegas because it just has a completely different feel and tone because literally the people who attend there, basically everyone who goes there is a goon. <laughs> like, it's almost like the Wikipedia uh, conventions where, like, everyone is important in those conventions. So, like, it's just a completely different feel. It's really freaking awesome. Uh, but we did make one, and I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to show you. This is roughly how many guides we currently set up. So we just did one for Hope. We're going to do one for RightsCon, which starts in two days. Then Black Hat USA, Ring Zero, we're going to cover a bit. DEF CON Safe Mode, Diana Initiative, and Google CTF. And unfortunately, we forgot there's another convention in here. So later on tonight, before even RightsCon, it actually might expand to eight different guides. And I'm the one that do, does all these guides, so this is kind of insane. Um, right now, what we're focused on is Hope 2020. It's going on literally right now until Sunday, August 2nd at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, they are doing their own custom streams on Livestream.com, but they're also on Periscope TV via tw uh, Twitter, uh, Twitch, which we're going to restream. And we're going to try to restream the YouTube, but if you go to the 2600 channel on YouTube, and we have all the links in here, there's that. Which, And also, uh, the way everyone's going to communicate, because most of these type of virtual conferences, they're going to have basically one mode so you can view everything and one mode so you can chat. And so we broke things down with live streams and the chat they're going to use is they've made their own right. It's a big pain in the butt. I'm actually going to solve some of the pain in the butt stuff here uh, live. And uh, and we also talk about the accessibility. Well, while the panels are being streamed for free, everything else is behind a ticket. Jack and uh, thankfully bought me a, a ticket a while ago along with one for himself. So we're going to look into stuff later, like certain like workshops and stuff. Some of them we might live stream or not. Um, and yeah, we did a little bit about hope and this is kind of all the main stuff. So as we announced, instead of picking all the amazing talks, because really all the online talks are amazing this year, we're going to cover each live stream. Uh, we're going to cover each keynote each day. So we just covered Cory Doctorow and then tomorrow at 4 PM. So that's uh, Sunday at 4 PM. If I remember correctly. Yep. Uh, we're going to be covering, uh, uh, Richard theme Thyme. I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, which talks about, um, kind of the hacker mindset and revolution during like a crisis time like this pandemic. And there's also one for uh, Jaron Lerner, uh, who's a 
there's a whole bunch. He's basically like the, one of the few good people at Microsoft. He's like the giant hippie at Microsoft. And then uh, I'm not going to pronounce her first name because I'm going to screw it up. But Mindler, who is a person I hugely remi- admire, who is one of the directors of Data for Black Lives. We follow her on, uh, tr- on uh, Instagram and her organization on Instagram. That's going to be really fun to like. I'm really glad that like minorities are stepping up themselves and getting involved into the digital stuff because often that digital divide as someone who's a minority, uh, a racial minority and a sexual minority, uh, those digital divides and classism really destroys that, which is why you have, for example, um, even though it's improving, uh, still less women in STEM and InfoSec. It's why you have less African Americans in there, and you don't really have that many of either in any predominant roles or any represent real representation because of how systemic this is, mainly just due to class, aka wealth. Um, and then we're gonna color uh, Idalian, who I love. I've been to a couple of her TechActivist.org meetings in. Um, in New York City, that's going to be great to see. And then Tiffany Rad, who's absolutely amazing. I'm going to recover these also. She is the – if you like car hacking, you need to bow to this woman. She's not only a great uh, person to hang out with, but every every year for like eight years, she was like the main person talking about car hacking before Tesla came along, before – you know, the Toyota debacle before, like, she was doing, like, OG early 2000 vehicles, and then, yeah, she's been doing ve- professional vehicle computer research since uh, t- since uh, 2006, and I would go to those talks every year, and they were just so fascinating, how you read a CAN bus system through Linux and all this stuff, and then Tesla became popular, and all of a sudden, bro, dude, bro, and all these bros came out, so when you look at car hacking, it's like, car hacking, or... Brewing alcohol, it's the same white people with badly done mustaches with wax in them. Like, you know, it's not as bad as the cryptocurrency community, but I just feel sad that Tiffany just did so much work and so much promotion about car hacking, and she's been basically just forgotten about by, like, the car hacking village and everyone else. And I'm glad that she's a keynote at Hope because this is, like, she deserves this position for the amount of car hacking. Basically, we would not have a car hacking village. We wouldn't have a Tesla, in my opinion, unless... The Tiffany existed, so I cannot wait for that uh, on the 30th, which, if I remember correctly, is like a midday, I think. It's like, it's on Thursday. And then uh, we have also, which I'm interested in, COVID uh, cybersecurity attacks with uh, Agio. And then it's gonna, uh, and then we have uh, Libby here, who's part of the Open Technology Fund, as you heard uh, recently. The Cheeto in chief, the one who can do this very complicated exam of listing five objects in a row, and somehow that proves that he's sane. Um, the the Open Technology Fund was recently just, um, blown to smithereens by the administration, so I can't wait to hear what she has to say about that. And that ends with, um, Cindy Cohen, who is one of the main lawyers at the EFF and does a lot of stuff with the Tor Project. So it's going to be a great keynote. And every day at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, slightly before that, so, like, sometimes we'll be starting at 3, sometimes 3.30, sometimes at 3.50, but we will be streaming on time, except for this one, all of those. Uh, and then we just did a highlight of some of the amazing workshops. We actually tried to submit in workshops this year, but um, we just got really super busy. So unless they add something in at the last minute, we might do a lightning talk. We're definitely going to do a bumper that we'll air on the live stream. I don't know. But there's a huge list of workshops that happen all seven days. But if you want kind of like what we think are the highlights and stood out, we have a bunch here about like building ventilators. Um, uh, the home uh, web application hacking kit is actually done by BSI Lab, who's one of our early uh, attendees uh, at DEF CON 201, who now runs the Girls Who Hack stuff. She's just absolutely amazing. There's a COBOL CTF. that I need to get on that. that that's going to be, is it tomorrow, I think? No, that's going to be on Wednesday. I, I know I did COBOL back in the day. I'm not an expert at it, but I do know how to program it. And that's going to be so much fun. It'll let me like be on Rusty. I think that's a brilliant thing. Sent OS and how to do stuff remotely. Uh, cons- I like this idea of maker faction for activism for kids. Like that's just great. Uh, there's a lot of making your own tools here, making your own edible dyes. No, dyes, not edibles. Edibles is a completely different thing. Um, just a fun of really... Really cool stuff. The Tech Learning Collective, uh, our friends uh, at the FA, are going to be doing some uh, panels, including one of my favorites, the password uh, cracking, where you learn how to crack passwords. And also, now, now that you know the red teaming of how to crack them, then they teach the blue teaming of how you 
stump most hackers for the common stuff that you just did and learn actual security techniques. I think that's brilliant. Python and Telnet, enough said. It just These are just amazing workshops. Like I'm honestly more hyped for the workshops this year than any of the talks. And that's not to diss any of the talks going on right now. As you saw, my friend XLogic is doing this amazing thing about bootlo bootloaders and video games by coding at the mail. It's just great. And there will be um, some virtual villages and contests and stuff like that. There's a lockpicking village, which I'm going to go to one of their classes because I want to see how they're going to teach this. I'm going to bite my tongue and save it to A after I see one of their classes, and B, I'm going to reserve my opinion of the Master of Unlocking, which will happen at the end of Hope on August 2nd. So my opinion about the lockpicking village, because they're not using anyone particularly from like core tool this year, uh, I'll save it for that episode. So check that out at 8 p.m. on August 2nd on a Sunday. Uh, the Cyberpunk Now Film Festival, we, Gia, Jack, and I might enter in that, but we have to see what the rules are. But I just love this kind of – DEF CON does a similar thing where they have like a uh, a festival, you know, like a thing where they're like, here's these parameters, try to make a short, quick film, and you do it during the con, and then at the end they air them all and prizes are given out. It's going to be really awesome. I love that they're doing this virtually. And Jota City is so cyberpunk AF that I, for, depending on what their parameters are, I think we could do. I'm going to finally ask this question in chat, which uh, Skeej asked, in your opinion, which convention is the best for DEF CON? Uh, I don't know what VBL is or VB1, but is it Black Hat or, or Hope? Um, honestly, if you can go to almost all the conventions you can, the way I break it down is it's more like what you want to get out of it. Uh, most of the big, especially the big conventions, they're all very unique. If you look at like where they're located and what building, or in this case, what what sort of internet platform they're using, you can kind of tell what they are here. And again, Hope leans a lot towards activism and about like the community and the hacker stuff. It's not that they don't have cool tools. I mean, I was showing you they were doing like rubber duckies and oints tools, and we were just watching some bootloader uh, coding to the metal stuff earlier. But they really do focus on like activism, and I'm pretty sure they're, a lot of their stuff is really focused on like Black Lives Matter and the Hong Kong protests and stuff right now, which that needs to be done and said because that's the real hacker ethic right there. Uh, but that's what you would get out of Hope is that community sense as well as like you know, just what's going on society-wise that we're hacking. It's more of systems hacking. Um, DEF CON is very all well-rounded, but remember it originated as a party in Vegas, so it still has those vibes. And then Black Hat is still, even with the virtualized stuff, very corporate suit and tie. So that's, that's to answer your question. It's really what you want to get out of it. Um, I would just say ask around, even if it's your local DEF CON or 2600 meeting, uh, if you want to learn and grow. And if you want to learn and grow uh, with us at DEF CON 201, you can follow us on our streams right now on Twitch and YouTube and uh, um, I'm forgetting what, DLive. We're going to make a Facebook one soon. Uh, click uh, follow or subscribe if you want to see more content like this. We love this. So last year they had the Anarchist Village. And I think the reason why they're back this year is not only because they love being just a stain on everything, which I think is great, but I'm not kidding because it's been so long, so this disclosure on this. When the security team, which I'm so glad we don't have this year, no offense to them, fell absolutely apart because they were absolutely dumb and completely forgot what actual security uh, OSIN and recon is, um, the Anarchist Village people literally was the security team that year, and they handled everything flawlessly. Um, I think that's why they're like promoted as this big village this year. But they're going to have a bunch of stuff uh, here. I'm going to actually figure out when these documentaries are. I think these are all next week. But we're going to – we might do streams looking at these documentaries depending on what day they're on uh, that they're going to be playing. We might listen to some of the cool music. It's, it's basically like a hangout village, and it's a lot of fun. And they're using Mozilla Hubs, which I kind of wish we were using for the DEF CON group stuff because I only found this out recently because, again, I've been that busy. I literally lost two and a half weeks of, like, doing stuff uh, because I was doing everything else. But, yeah. There's that village. Uh, Dim Sum Labs is the only hackerspace village this year. They're a hackerspace village in Hong Kong, so we're going to hear about the Hong Kong protests and just see what another part of the world is like. They have a bunch of different projects. They're on Freenode and IRC. They're also using um, – uh, what is it called? Um, they're also using the uh, uh, Mozilla Hubs uh, to check out their stuff. We're going to look at that probably later, either on this stream or tomorrow's stream. Radio Statler, which I'm normally at, um, they're they're back. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing anything with them this year because, again, I lost so much stuff, but they're that. Yeah. Oh, they're running a – oh, they have a Jitsi with uh, a YouTube. That that makes sense. There's a video stream and audio stream. I have no idea what the scheduling is. Let's take a quick look. Slim pick a dive. Be a Scilab. Gus is talking. I think we missed most of these. 
uh, Bia might be talking again. I'll have to look at that. Let's see. Tomorrow is a fairly thin schedule. See, normally I would fill the schedule up with so much stuff. It's just I was, like, hammered with job stuff and DEF CON and everything else. So, like, I just feel really bad. They're restreaming all the keynotes. That's good. I'm going to actually reach out to them and see if they might want to re-air the audio, maybe video feed of some of the stuff we're doing. I kind of wish they would re-air Crypto Barons, but I haven't reached out to them yet. So hopefully, like, next week we'll be able to do um, a, uh, a, a restreaming of um, maybe G.I. Jack will do a special Archvile Linux perspective, but we'll see. But we'll try to do a hack all and Commander here, and then uh, for the last day here... Oh, it's gonna uh, see. It's gonna keep going. I was about to say, um, we might do a master of unlocking. So we'll see how that goes. And Radio Stat like closes early. Maybe I'll do a special master of unlocking just for them. But we'll see how the, how this goes. I wish we could air Crypto Barons. I'm gonna reach out to them real quick and be like, hey, here's the stream. If you want to restream this, go right ahead for Crypto Barons. But if I'm still doing that today, I'm actually gonna end very soon because of that. But we're gonna look at some other stuff. But yeah, Radio Statler's here. Let Let's snoop in and see if they're saying anything. Oh, B is still on. So, uh, you are pretty young, uh, 13 is, is, uh... She's also pretty short. <laughs> you know, it's not, like, it's definitely not old. Uh, and you started giving talks... We are all uh, old. We are all incredibly old. Uh, what was the first talk that you gave, actually? Probably and, never going to mention us, by the way. Types. And I honestly just loved it. I loved it. I love giving <laughs> talks. And I'm an extrovert, so I love just being around humans. That's why I also hate just being stuck at home. Yeah. But um, so uh, have you had any issues with people not taking you seriously because of your age? Or have you not seen a lot of issues with that? Uh, um, half and half, honestly. Um, I've had... When I go to go give talks and my mom is with me, mm -hmm. people will usually ask, hey, are you BSI Lab to my mom? And then my mom's like, no, she is. And then it's just short little me, hi. <laughs> uh, sometimes I find that kind of annoying, but how are they supposed to know I'm 13 if they don't really know about me and know that I'm kids? Yeah. It's understandable, but, you know, a little annoying sometimes. Uh, that's, I think, very understandable. Um, but uh, it's good that, uh, not to say that 50 50 is a good ratio, but like uh, it's good to see that you're able to be out there and doing talks and doing the presentations. And Anyone who doesn't take her seriously, I feel I think bad that, for them. Uh, that what person's going to Talking die about what you're saying is very important. Um, so uh, if there are any other questions that people have, uh, please go ahead and put them in the Discord. Uh, or in IRC, if you are on IRC. Uh, so, uh, in terms of hobbies, like, um, do you spend all your time doing projects, or do you she brings do up anything that else, like reading, playing face. video games, um, playing musical instruments? Like, she, she's smiling. What do you do when you're um, not, like uh, you know, everything. working to save the world? <laughs> I guess is the question. I have a lot of hobbies. My goal in life is to really just try everything. By everything, I mean everything. I really want to skydive. I don't know why. Um, I do fencing, archery. Um, well, I like reading. I, I play Minecraft. Um, that person is gonna be I so like dead. playing chess. And yeah. Okay. That's a wide variety of things. Um, Beatrice is doing what would really you say well is like here. your like, favorite the best, like, totally uh, the take wide over list that you just stated uh, up. And you can say you don't have one and you like them all equally. It's it's no pressure. I'm just curious. They should ask it honestly question. depends on my mood, but one of them, if I'm ever bored and my brain is just like, and <laughs> just dead, like yeah. it's dead. I can't actually think of anything since most of my other hobbies um, take, well, brain power. Yeah. Um, I like playing around with like interior design and designing and stuff like that. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, aside from giving your talk, uh, have you gotten a chance to look at the schedule of talks, uh, for Hope? Um, 
Um, I haven't looked at the schedule. I was uh, planning on doing that because I, I want to watch some talks. Okay, that's definitely uh, a good idea. Um, then, um, so as much as I love yes, Bia, been so busy, you haven't gotten a chance to see the I'm going to stop that here. But you can go to Radio Statler. That's at, uh, let me just double check, make sure my microphone's on. Yep. At uh, radio.hope.net to see all that stuff there. Again, I'm usually super involved, but this this time, like, literally because of the virtualization and some of the stuff going on in my personal life, it's not bad stuff. It's just a lot of stuff. So that was all there. There's also going to be a Hacker Scott talent. I think that starts tomorrow. Yeah, it starts tomorrow. Ah! Held by Jason Scott here in his Shriner drag. There's going to be a Radio Village uh, that will be there. Uh, I don't really have the link for that yet, but once I get that, it'll be soon. There'll be various concerts. We we might, depending on the schedule, let me look at something quickly with the schedule here, because I know the demos are on tonight. Um, for the demo scenes, yeah, because that goes on forever. Okay, so when we do Crypto Barons, and Crypto Barons happens at 8, so... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so, like, when we're basically done with Crypto Barons, I'm going to raid, we're going to raid the Hope stream, I'm going to rehost it, and we're just going to air all the demos. So if you go to our um, Twitch, you will see all the demos. By the way, if you have any questions about Hope or what I've done in the past with them and stuff or anything, really, during any of these special streams, please let me know. Uh, we're going to be ending uh, this soon, so I just wanted to go over that. But, yeah, we're going to be doing that. I think... Today, we're going to raid Project Melody if she's still running, <laughs> uh, just because it's her anniversary. And she's a weird AI bot that I absolutely love. And um, But we're still going to rehost um, the Hope stuff on our actual stream. But we're going to send everyone here to uh, probably Project Melody because that will just be really funny. Um, but let, let's look, let's quickly like sum up the rest of the Hope schedule here, right? So um, let's go back to our guide. And there's also going to be like a cool performance thing by the XL Terrestrials. It's always some crazy fufu tofu eating thing. And that was that was the hope, first hope badge I ever had. I don't know what happened to all my old badges. I think I unfortunately lost all of them because you know when your parent when a parent dies, a lot of terrible things happen, especially if you're me. Uh, not in that way, not her death. I mean in terms of like property rights and things like that. Uh, meaning I had a lot of personal stuff of mine thrown out during all that. I don't want to think about that. But yeah, this was the Open AMD project. This was their first true electronic badge. Now, H2K2, I believe, they actually, their badge was an actual MetroCard swipe, and it also had a SIM chip on it. Um, but this was the first true electronic badge, like what we're now used to. A lot of cons do electronic badges now. Uh, but what was neat about it is that we we used um, a, a improved modified version of the Chaos Computer Congress and um and what do you call it here and uh yeah it took like a, a hearing aid type battery uh or a battery you would find in like a, a modern day uh wristwatch and basically it would we would put all these routers these ginormous routers that now would cost less and would be really tiny and have better and bigger range as well as more stable signaling and we would have a 3d virtualization project that would track you through everything of course we don't need that anymore because one the uh the google does that for us and two is that uh, we're all virtual now, and we don't want to dox everyone. But yeah, we have a whole guide for this. And again, we're going to be making uh, – we listed seven guides, but it's probably going to be eight guides by the end of this. I might put like a bonus in here in between these two uh, for the other con that's going around. So that that's mostly that. Now, here's the thing I want to try to figure out here is this riot. So let's – I think we have to start this over again. It's, it's, it's riot.hope.net. Now, this is before they became elemental, or element. Um, so, let's see. Do you want to... Not now. Oh, I'm already logged in. Okay, good. I was just... Right, other users might trust it. Verify. Um, we're going to... I'm going to get the laptop now, because this is, this is the thing I have to do here, because... The one thing that Element has not changed from Riot is that they, they're they still very anal about their security to the point where it's now become annoying. And again, that's always the pro the balance with security is the trade-off between, you know, convenience and difficulty. Because normally, normally the more convenient you make something, the less difficult it is to crack. And usually the more difficult you make something to crack the more um 
the less usable it becomes. However, in my experience, as we've seen with things like uh, things like um, uh, uh, Signal with their pin usage and Keybase being brought out by Zoom and things like that, I would honestly say probably the 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 bigger problem. Oh, I use this mouse pad. The bigger problem now is that uh, let's do this. Is um, compare emojis. Yep, they match. And then we do it on our end. And now it's verified because I originally set up on this laptop. See, I need the mouse for this because this, this laptop conks out. <laughs> so, the next thing we're going to do, and this is where I get to switch screens here. And Poe and Corey doc Doctorow's book here. The Doctorow's book is, um, let's see, message me to redeem your ticket. So, uh, what I'm going to do here, for security's sake, is I'm going to actually take down this. And I'm going to make me bigger. And I wish I had this option in real life to make me bigger. I'll let you imagine what I mean by that. But uh, this is basically going to allow me, not only do you get to see all this handsomeness here, but uh, this will allow me to do some stuff behind the scenes where I can go in and um, s set up the rest of my account here. <laughs> Um, I actually don't remember if I sent it yet. No, I haven't sent it yet. I did copy it, though. So let me go in because basically a friend of my, uh, uh, our co-founder bought me my ticket. So, oh, I think you might have forwarded it here or maybe it's just a mailing list post. Yeah, it's just a mailing list post. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the thing that he sent me here. And then I'm going to do some wiggity woggity woo transfer stuff. Um, to send it over to myself. So I'm going to use my private email here and write Pope 2020 token. I'm going to send that data over. So that's all that. Now, hopefully I should get this if I don't have any email screw-ups. So we're going to wait a little bit. I'm going to hit the refresh here uh, because what you have to do with the way they set up their element, uh, their custom matrix element, is um, you have a token Yep, that comes in, and I believe you message them the token key, the bot that they have in the chat, and then that's going to... Um, That's going to do the uh, dinkity doodles here. So we're going to go back to the Riot chat. We're going to do the Hope Core bot and type in. Hopefully, this does it. Let me go back to the bot, because I know everyone was confused by this earlier. I see what's going on. All right, so what I'm going to do here... I'm going to remove this message, and I'm going to leave this, and I'm going to do that. That should hopefully work with the bot. Yep, now we're in. So I'm going to... Uh, shrink myself again. It's like Alice in Wonderland here. Uh, here we go. Oop. 
I'm small. And we're going to bring up the Hope 2020 thing. Let's make this full screen. And let's see what we have in here. We have a bunch of invites. So we have uh, there's a chill lounge, which I'll accept. It's a little slow because we're streaming right now. We're probably going to get a lot of people in the chat. Holy cow. Um, there's one dedicated room for the live stream Q&A. So again, if you got tickets and you don't know how to get in, you have to go to, uh, if I remember correctly, riot dot like hope.net I believe it is it, it's we have the link of it right on our blog for the guide and what you're going to do is you are going to uh, find the bot because it's going to be the first that pops to the chat you click that bot you click message and then you uh, the hope core bot and then you type in ticket space and then whatever the hash code that they sent you in the email for the ticket and it will add you as a random room uh, it will then add you uh, for, uh, <laughs> what was that picture again? Hey, God. A random. Let's see. That was in random, right? Or was that in tech support? Or hallway. It's in one of these. I saw a funny image. Performances, yeah. That was from the first ever hackers.cal. You see Jason's not abused here. Emmanuel's like, why the hell am I going here? And why do I make, why do I have Leia's bun ears on the side? Uh, I believe that's aesthetics that he was confused. And then Rob's just like absolutely living for all of this insanity that was going on. I, I wasn't there for that, but I saw the live stream for that. That was amazing that year. I believe that was Hope 11. Yep, the 11th Hope says on the podium because I can't read. The workshops, which is a big one I have to do. And this will be good because then I can actually join workshops and things like that. There's a water cooler, which is weird because there's already a random room. And then Hope Announcements. And then uh, hope attendees. So every time we do a keynote, um, we are going to go into the chat, and we if we're going to ask questions during live stream Q and A, uh, and do things like that. In fact, I'm actually going to go in and be like, "Yo, you are on the DefCon 201 live stream right now. Quick for the next minute or two." Does anyone have anything they want to shout out for people to read on the stream? Hopefully we don't get like banned or something for that. But I just did that. We're going to see if anyone actually responds in here. <laughs> and hopefully I don't get like insta banned for bringing up DEFCON. But we are a DEFCON group. Uh, so... We might have a response. Someone just wrote woo. So we're, hello, fans. Def God, howdy, howdy. <laughs> oh, this is neat. I'm going to type in uh, every keynote hour each day. We are going to check on the chat in here live. And we will announce when. Type that properly. Announce when we do. So we look forward to the ins insanity. Free Software Society, yep. Now, we already bought tickets. We already bought tickets uh, at MW. So yeah, that's the uh, Riot Chat. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out of full screen here. Uh, if you go to our guide, if you're ever confused, there's also the wiki on the website. Um, but new Demcod music, uh, if you go to riot.hope.net or click the link, um, you then join their riot. Uh, you have to, even if you have an existing matrix account, you have to create a new account for their riot. And then you are going to then message the hope conference bot. You will see it. You'll click on his, uh, logo, the bots logo, send a private message and then put token or no ticket. And then the hash that was sent as your, uh, ticket. And uh, it will then add you to all the groups, and it proves that you actually paid for the thing, which we did through cryptocurrency. So uh, that will be it for the stream today. In uh, in the future, uh, after and during the um, keynotes, we will look at the different things. So we look at briefly at Radio Statler. We'll check in at Radio Statler, and we'll also check on the Riot chat. 
Um, and uh, tomorrow, uh, basically each day we're gonna check a village. So I think tomorrow we're gonna check Dim Sum Lamb uh, Labs in the VR. Um, we're going to see if we can get the Ar Arth Village. We're definitely gonna check out the Anarchist Village. And depending on the shows and stuff, again, we're going to restream everything on Twitch. We will try to do the same thing for YouTube. But during the keynotes every day until August 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, usually an hour to a half hour to 10 minutes before starting, but around 4 p.m., we will watch every keynote and we are commenting on them. Some of my roommates, when they're actually up, might jump in and talk about their hope experiences and comment on them. It should be really fun. And so we hope to see you. And I'll actually click on this at... Uh, 4 p.m. for uh, Richard Thyme or Richard Thiem's uh, keynote. Uh, we'll actually probably start an hour early to watch the EFA panel because we're part of the Electronic Frontier Alliance, so that will be neat. Um, and we might see a little bit of how your mobile phones check. I oh, know that's a librarians. We might see a little bit about the librarian response. Uh, and oh, Bia's election things happening, so we might have a couple of things to look at after the, the keynote. Definitely right before the keynote, so that that will be uh. That will be really cool. But, yeah, so we hope to see you tomorrow at, like, 3 p.m., and then we'll watch the keynote together and fart around, and we'll definitely check out a new thing. Today we looked at Radio Stat Statler, the Riot Village, and if you're ever confused, go to our Medium blog, which is right on our website at defcon201.org, and um, we will uh, – and uh, we have all the information about everything going on at Hope 2020. All right, and someone just wrote uh, another bonus about – let's go back to that chat. That was great. Uh, I'm going to like this thing. Holy crap. Uh, that another bonus about hope is uh, nobody's on segways. Nobody's getting hurt on segways. I was there for that. I'll, that was uh, I literally was looking over right when the guy he because what they did is normally they the staff has some segways and they usually have public segways, but at the end there's a cutoff point and they take all the batteries out. Someone left a battery in and it was half charged, so a group of drunk people came up and were like. Yeah, it's a Segway. I know how to ride this, and we're just drunk as skunks. And there was a guy who went on, and he literally went full throttle, fell off of it in such a way that it threw him off on the side, so he was turning in the air when he got thrown off, and he hit right against the wall, back of his head first, and it was just a giant red splatter. There was actually brain matter everywhere and an ambientic fluid, and basically he had no back of his head. You could see in his skull with his brain and everything. It was absolutely nightmarish, and I was looking exactly where he hit, right? I was looking like, I around, and I looked at it, and boom, right there, right on my eye line, and I had to down all the alcohol before the police get up. Like, I literally put all the alcohol away, and anyone that had any open booze, I don't care if it was a shot or an entire bottle of vodka, I just dunked it and threw it. The security actually asked me to do that because that's my specialty is just downing drinks because I'm half Polish, so I'm the designated professional alcoholic of everybody, but that that's a hope story for that. That's a... Disclosure there. I'm glad the guy. I'm mad that he did that, but I'm glad the guy lived because that was already on top of all the other crappy stuff going on with like all the alt right who are now probably all boogaloo boys and so rather that. A shout out to um, Jim Ryan. You suck balls for doing that. Um, and also, Hope Security Team doesn't have anything to screw up this year. Neither does the Hope PR team. And honestly, the Hope PR team, it could have been better. They should have promoted more, but their leagues better than they were last year and any previous other year. So that was neat. Anyhow, I'm going to do more in chat here. I'm going to check. I'm going to try to check out a workshop so I know what workshops we're going to jump into tomorrow and some of the villages and stuff. So, again, I'll see you around here. We're going to – tomorrow I'm going to be here at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because we're going to look at the EFA panel, check on our friends there, then watch the keynote, and then we might watch some stuff after this. And we're definitely going to check out a village or a workshop. We're going to do that every day until August 2nd. And then we have more stuff to do during Black Hat. We have a crap ton of stuff to do during DEF CON. And, again, like I said, I'm writing – eight seven to eight guides this is all the conventions going on and stuff to do during ultimate hacker summer camp camp which is all of august so it's crazy anyhow that that's our spe that was our special today um yeah thank you for all uh watching this uh if you enjoyed uh, me as side pocket i'm the co-founder of defcon 201 you can check out our website below at defcon uh 201.org as i then increase my mass and size because you know uh, i like being pompous like that there we go. There you can see all the follicles in my crazy hair. Um, 
You can hit the follow or subscribe button if you like the content that you see on here, whether you're on Twitch, DLive, or YouTube. We're going to be looking on, uh, we're going to try to get our uh, Periscope back soon, and we're going to look on to Facebook, not Facebook Gaming, but Facebook itself. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow. But yeah, check us out, defensetoa.org, Jer Dirty Jersey represent, hack the planet, and everyone have a really fun hope, and I will see you all in two hours for Crypto Barons, where we're going to look at Google Libra, we're going to look at all the coding that's currently on it that's open source. We're going to actually run programs that are in production for it. And we're going to look at their policies and show why this is a bad idea. So in between watching Hope, we hope you enjoy that show. So watch out for Crypto Barons at 8 p.m. EST tonight. Either way, I'm Side Pocket. Peace out. Hack the planet.